Yes, absolutely. Well, who's the ultimate owner? If you say a land trust, and I have this land trust supposedly owning this property, who has the title deed? What legal no, system are we that, using to trust? It's not that simple. Who has controlling interest is what you've got to ask yourself. Because a lot of times, oh, let's say that you owned uh, 50 acres. <coughs> they come up to you, and right now they've got this thing where they're, they're going after seniors to you know preserve their land for future generations and they'll come and say you know it would be morally reprehensible of you not to preserve some of your land for future generations and what I'd like to do is I know you don't want to have a factory in your yard and they'll use all kinds of fearful imagery like that so, so let us help you we'll do all the work all you got to do is sign we'll give you a check in the end and it's really a promise that you won't do any of these things and you know, it will be a cut in your taxes and such. And so it's land confiscation. But you will be left owning the property technically. So if there's a violation, you can be, uh, they can be knocking on your door. And let me tell you something else about these agreements. Let's say you did think that was a good idea and you contract with them. You seem like a reasonable guy. I can't imagine you would sign a contract that shifts under your feet or a contract that you don't know the conditions of. Well, what they do is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is a term that you, you're probably going to be familiar with, is um, best management practices. This is a term that, that I'm trying to get land trusts not to use anymore. Or if they do, to quote a revision date. Here's what happens. Say you're a big farmer out in the Midwest. Let's say instead of 50 acres, you've got 50,000. Well, you say, all right, I can do that. I, I'm not going to put any factories on my field. I want to keep cutting or cutting hay. And you say, you're going to let me? Sure, great. I'll get a check, lower taxes. Can't uh, see anything wrong there. Well, we all know farmers have a very thin profit margin. Many of them are propped up with government subsidies, but still, thin margins nonetheless. You agree to these best management practices. The language for those things that you can do under this restriction, highly detailed, very specific, surgically precise. Those things that you cannot do are always vague in generalizations. Now, what if, under the best management practices, because that's going to be one of the things that you agree to, they're going to say, yeah, I just got to agree to best management practices, and they'll make it sound right. generic, and like it, it's not a thing. But it is. It's a, it's a title on a document that says best management practices. And then it's pages and pages and pages of standards. Well, every once in a while, you'll get some yahoos from the planning agency and a couple firecracker uh, interns from the university, and they'll rehash these management standards. What is a best management practice? Well, now, for you and all your fields, a best management standard is a 500 foot dust buffer around every field. Now how many bushels of produce or bales of hay does that translate into? They're doing that to farmers. They are putting dust buffers around nothing. Just their neighbor's property. It could be another field. Or a road. Or a house. I mean... Wildlife. It, it, wildlife. I've seen more... Uh, Michael Kaufman, he was mentioned earlier, he did some research that showed that clear cuts had the greatest uh, quantity and the greatest diversity of wildlife. They come into these clear cuts because all of a sudden there's things opened up that have never been there before. The seed bank is exposed. The critters that come into a clear cut forested area are exponentially more than what will be in the surrounding forest. And, uh, you know, it, what happens, to, to get back to your question, you may be left holding the bag and, you know, for one-third of what's left of the, the value of your property. You'll be the landowner of record, but you won't be able to do much of anything with the property. So if the person dies, what happens to the property? Uh, any one of the number of things. They, they you could, can't separate land ownership from land conservation. Mm. Well, it was, you know, I could hand it down to my kids, and you could hand it down to your kids, but they will not be able to do anything more. And eventually, someone will say, I can't even afford the taxes, and who's going to take it? So it's land confiscation. That's what it comes down to eventually. This is land use socialism, and I'm not afraid to say that. These people who come in 
the, the attorney was, oh, I was so ashamed that he even did this. He came into our town selectman's meeting and he started rattling off these numbers of how much it costs for taxes and how much to send a kid to school. And he looked in, in the selectman's eye and said, you don't need more families and more kids in where. <laughs> Out in the hall, this idiot, he, he looks at me and says, we gotta really start talking about population control. We got a global population problem. And I'm like, holy mackerel, am I? And he says, you know what else? He says, look at what Utah did. Look at the preservation Utah did. And, and at that point, I jumped up from the bench. I was sitting down here just kind of shaking my head. I jumped up and I said, Mr. Please go back into the selectmen's meeting room and say that in front of the cameras. Utah is suing the federal government under eminent domain to get its land back. Why didn't you tell them on TV that you're about global population control? Yeah. Oh, I and mean, people say this is conspiratorial stuff. What happens when you have a socialized uh, health care program that only focuses on the productive? When Planned Parenthood is well funded? What can that do to a population over time? Just, if, if we don't care for our young people, 